It is human nature to test the bounds of science, to be tempted by its power, for the chance to play God. In careless hands, that power can be menacing. We are capable of making monsters. Frankenstein, the story of a mad scientist who creates a horribly ugly monster with electrodes in his neck and a stolen brain. A mute, tormented creature, driven to violence, who finally dies in a fire set by angry villagers. Not exactly. This is the real story of Frankenstein. It was inspired by the waking dream of Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley in 1816. Night waned upon this talk, and even the witching hour had gone by before we retired to rest. When I placed my head on my pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. With shut eyes but acute mental vision, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half vital motion. could see ahead, she could see that science was going to change our, our attitudes toward God totally, that it would have to. The scientific invention would have to start um, causing us to be frightened of our own brain capacity and what we could do. This is the beginning of a genetically engineered brave new world. Nuclear weapons are obscene and they are against every human principle. They, they can only destroy. It uh, initially starts out to be a blessing to turn into a Frankenstein. I think the reason that we're so concerned, for instance, about nuclear war, about uh, biochemical engineering, about genetic engineering, about DNA manipulation, comes from the tradition of Frankenstein, the novel, the recognition that scientists, as they begin to manipulate, change nature, may do more damage than good. The heart is beating more regularly now. Yes, it's been beating for nine hours. Not yet, but soon, and the brain, perfect, and already in position, then we are almost ready, almost. Science has given us increasingly powerful tools to control life. We can fight disease, manipulate our very nature, and wage war on each other more efficiently than ever before. Such knowledge can betray us. The term Frankenstein has come to mean anything that we set in motion that we can't control. And when you look around you at the, the numbers of things in our world that have been set in motion and are anything but under control from ecology to, you know, to weaponry to uh, everything, anything. But the central theme in Frankenstein, the idea of actually producing artificial life, 
may be the most intoxicating challenge of all. That reality may be closer than we think. Whether born in a test tube or a computer, our creations already seem to be very much alive. Frankenstein's monster, history was more concerned with battles and borders than technology. The French Revolution dominated European politics of the late 18th century. But in 1769, the invention of the steam engine ignited the Industrial Revolution, and the rhythm of daily life was changed forever. Science had become the new frontier. Public experiments were staged to spark interest in chemistry. Electricity was the rage. Luigi Galvani attached electrodes to a dead frog. A current stimulated the creature, causing its legs to twitch and quiver. Surgeons went one step further with the corpses of criminals. The results made it seem plausible that electricity could actually raise the dead. Percy Bysshe Shelley, the romantic poet, was an unlikely observer of all this progress. His fascination with chemistry was to echo in the life of Frankenstein. Percy Shelley met Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin when she was 15. Her father, William Godwin, was a radical theorist. Mary's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was one of the first feminists. She died just 10 days after giving birth to Mary. She read obsessively, read her mother's books, uh, read all her works over and over again, because, of course, it was a way of replacing the dead mother by trying to come to terms with her through her works. Mary Shelley had a, a very interesting childhood because she was the child of two of the most famous intellectuals of the age. And uh, her mother, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, was a sensational woman, enormously admired in her own circle and by other intellectuals. So that I think she always wanted to be like her mother. She wanted to be a great person like her mother. And meanwhile, she was devoted to her father, who was another leading philosopher. And he was a sort of theoretician of the French Revolution for the English. And so I think she always grew up wanting to be a writer. Mary and Percy began stealing secret visits to her mother's grave. Mary became pregnant at 16. Although Percy was already married with two children, they decided to elope, and he and Mary ran away to France in 1814. It was filthy, it was rough, they didn't have a lot of money, it was, some of the traveling was on mules. Uh, all in all, uh, it, it wasn't your ideal honeymoon kind of experience. They came back six weeks later to settle in England, and, and there they had their problems. They came back penniless and really returned, because they were penniless, to uh, a very inhospitable greeting. Uh, Godwin refused to see either one of them and still pleaded with Mary uh, Shelley to come home. And uh, Shelley's father, Sir Timothy Shelley, would have nothing to do uh, with them either. And so they sort of had to run from um, debt collectors. And they were just on the run going from different addresses and meanwhile Mary Shelley being pregnant and Shelley hiding out and it was all very dramatic. Mary's first child, Clara, died at just two weeks of age. Her death left Mary inconsolable. She wrote in her journal, Dream that my little baby came to life again, that it had only been cold and that we rubbed it before the fire and it lived. Awake and find no baby. I think about the little thing all day. And the interesting thing about that, that dream um, is the association of fire with life, that you can give birth to something that's been dead. You can bring it back to life. People many times say that in that era, because there was so much uh, child death, that uh, people were more casual about it. Uh, I haven't found that to be the case, and certainly not in the Shelley's case. Uh, both, both parents were very upset about it. 
Mary and Percy's relationship was turbulent. Percy was having an affair with Mary's stepsister, Claire, who in turn was having an affair with another famous poet, Percy's great friend, Lord Byron. The summer of 1816 found the foursome in Switzerland, vacationing together on Lake Geneva. And this group would, would either go boating together or meet every evening and uh, discuss all sorts of things, uh, including the creation of life. The, the new evolution science was showing how uh, life might have evolved from smaller and smaller units so that in the end it was hard to see where God comes into it and very hard to see how the soul could possibly get in to the human body or where it would go to afterwards. It was the coldest summer in Europe in a century. So they're there freezing, and there's nothing they can do except stay indoors and try to stay warm. So they start telling each other ghost stories. And they decide, in fact, to have a competition as to who can write the best ghost story. The others all began a story. Uh, and eventually, she woke up in the middle of the night, as she records it herself, and, and saw the scene of the laboratory when the scientist was creating the creature and the creature rose uh, from that laboratory table and she jumped up herself horrified by her own nightmare and, uh, and then recorded it and she knew that she had her story. And so Frankenstein was born, conceived in the imagination of an 18-year-old girl. Frankenstein was published anonymously in London in 1818. I think most people, when they read Frankenstein, thought that it was a very powerful, strong, uh, formidable subject. And, and really, they did not think it was a woman's book. It was not suggested. People didn't guess that it was a woman's book. Uh, so that I think the reason that she that it was anonymous may have been that uh, she feared that having a woman's name on it uh, would cause a lot of hostile comment. I mean that quite often did happen if a woman was a first with a woman's first book, if she was afraid that it was somehow unfeminine. Mary Shelley is writing a gothic horror story, and I think there's a way in which she really feels embarrassed almost that she's sending out into the world this very frightening story. Um, she calls it finally my hideous progeny, says that she feels affection for it, but still recognizes that it's something that could really terrify. It was received well. It got uh, mixed reviews. Some people loved it, some people hated it. Uh, Sir Walter Scott loved it. Uh, it sold well. It was one of the successful books, one of the literary books of 1818. I don't think it gave the kind of hint that it was going to be uh, the kind of classic that it has become. Frankenstein was not the first in literary history to challenge the forces of good and evil. Dr. Faustus sold his soul to the devil in exchange for forbidden knowledge. Nor was the monster's creation the first man-made man. According to Jewish folklore, the golem was a creature made of clay, brought to life by a charm. He was a noble character who played the role of protector. Unfortunately, the removal of his charm deanimated the creature. Prometheus was one of the, the grand figures to the Romantics this idea of the god who stole fire or created man, depending on which version of the myth you, you have. There's also the, the way of looking at Prometheus as the overreacher, the, uh, the uh, creature who pushes beyond the limits, the boundaries allowed man and is punished for it. In Prometheus' case, he's strapped to a rock and where a curl picks up, picks at his liver every night. The Prometheus story is a very important influence in Frankenstein because of the concept of finding knowledge and what you do with the knowledge you find, the responsibility for the knowledge you acquire. And so the story begins. It is the late 18th century, the new age of exploration. Sea Captain Robert Walton is in search of the North Pole. On his voyage, 
the crew rescues a half-frozen man on a dog sled. I think, in a way, Walton is there to be a link between the reader and the story, so that they understand that this is a story about scientific uh, enterprise. But um, the other way of looking at Walton is that he's a more innocent Frankenstein. The rescued man's name is Victor Frankenstein. He is broken in body and spirit, but he claims he has a story to tell. The Frankenstein family gave their son a happy childhood in Switzerland. Victor was in love with his cousin, Elizabeth. There are definite parallels between Victor Frankenstein and Percy Shelley. Percy Shelley published his first volume of poetry under the pen name Victor. Um, he had exactly the same family that Victor Frankenstein did. He had a sister named Elizabeth. Victor was ambitious. He went to the University of Ingolstadt to study natural philosophy. As a boy, he had been inspired by his reading of alchemists and their quest to discover the elixir of life. And he's fascinated by this, most of all by this vision they have, this notion that they can, uh, that science can, not science, magic can control the world, can control nature and so on. When Benjamin Franklin started experimenting with electricity, Victor's imagination caught fire. There are images of electricity all the way through Frankenstein. And electricity was seen by many as the source of life, a source of life. And um, the idea, even something that might even be able to reanimate the dead or give life to something that was not living. Victor Frankenstein became intoxicated with his experiments. He was convinced that he could cross the boundary of life and death. He learns some chemistry, he learns some anatomy, and that enables him in two years to discover the secret of life, which, of course, all men have been searching for since the beginning of time. He's a very quick study, this, uh, this Victor Frankenstein is. And, uh, of course, he's, he's, he is, he's unhappy with the university because, uh, well, they don't have a course in creating life. So he goes off on his own and begins his experiments. <laughs> Victor Frankenstein's dream of creating life became his obsession. I pursued nature to her hiding places. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? <laughs> of awakening had arrived. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. By the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. Frankenstein's monster was hideous and Victor fled in terror. Oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could not be so hideous as that wretch. I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. You could say that, that the disaster is entirely Frankenstein's fault because he rejects his own creature. Or you could say more broadly that humanity finds it very difficult to relate to what is different. And so it may be that all our civilization is, is simply too narrow in its sympathies and understanding of, of what it is to be human or natural. What if I gave birth to a freak, 
to a monster? You know, could I love it in any way, in any case? What, is it possible to give birth to a child that would be so horrendous that you would want it to die, that you would want to kill it? And then finally, thinking back to her own mother, what if this child kills me? And of course, that's exactly what Victor Frankenstein is going through as that creature comes to life. The, the feeling that he's given birth to something so horrendous that he can't face it, runs away, abandons it immediately. The monster was left as helpless as a child. He spent years living in the woods, observing people secretly. Over time, he learned to read and speak with a language both poetic and passionate. My travels were long and the sufferings I endured intense. Nature decayed around me and the sun became heatless. Rain and snow poured around me. Mighty rivers were frozen. The surface of the earth was hard and chill and bare and I found no shelter. O oh, Earth, curses on the cause of my being. I found the whole part of the book very touching where the monster tells his own side of it. We feel compassion for him, we feel understanding. He's an outcast, he's a monster, yet we can see he's doomed. It's about us, really. The, the creature's own story, when he's telling his life story, is in some ways the most uh, profound and the most accomplished, because it actually shows you a human being, effectively, growing up all alone, growing up with no relatives. It was a very poignant story, like Robinson Crusoe's. The monster goes in search of Victor, seeking vengeance for his miserable existence. But along the way, he encounters Victor's little brother, William. William threatens him, and he uses the name Frankenstein. What happens is the creature becomes violent, and he murders the child. That is the moment of turning in the book because he then becomes the same as those around him and that's how he falls prey to the system it's a system that turns the good bad victor frankenstein has created a creature that he's failed to love he's turned it into the monster he's been the originating monster the one who failed to love and the monster in a sense imitates his own creator, but masters him at the same time. The monster confronts Victor in the mountains. Frankenstein! I was benevolent once. My soul glowed with love and humanity. Now I am miserably alone. These bleak skies are kinder to me than your fellow beings. Why should I pity man more than he pities me? What do you want of me? You must create a companion for me. A creature of another sex, as hideous as myself. My evil passion will leave me, for I will meet with love. And in my dying moments, I shall not curse my creator. The creature, in a healthy way, wants a family life. He wants a kind of Mrs. Monster, which you know, always sounds slightly comic, and, uh, and he, he wants to go away with her to South America to live on vegetables. That is always the second question asked by the monster in great horror stories is, where is there another one like me, and can we make more? And that theme runs through everything. And, and, and of course, in some ways, that theme allows us over and over again to reflect on our own fear of our own sexuality and the mystery and the magic and the terror of having a child and g giving a hostage to fortune. So Victor starts work on his second monster. But midway through his hateful task, he changes his mind. Now, what Victor Frankenstein does at this point, of course, is to rip up the female creature, rip it up, trembling with passion, as he says, mangling it, an image that I really think is almost a kind of rape. He literally pulls her apart and leaves the pieces on the floor. The monster is enraged by what he sees. What now consumed with hatred, he sets off on a mission of revenge. Victor's friends and family become his victims. 
It's that experience of being abandoned again and again and again that finally drives him into this rage, this violent, predatory rage that leads him to start murdering, murdering friends of, of Victor Frankenstein's as punishment to Victor, who has refused to, to give him a mate. Each desperate to destroy the other, Victor and the monster begin their chase to the death. The monster lures Victor into the depths of the Arctic wasteland. What his feelings were whom I pursued, I cannot know. Sometimes, indeed, he left marks in writing on the barks of trees or cut into stone that guided me and instigated my fury. When Frankenstein and the monster are chasing each other, or really, the monster's in front and Frankenstein is chasing him, trying to find him to kill him, when almost everybody else he cares about is dead. And I think that's very imaginatively described. It's a kind of wasteland, surreal, symbolic chase right up into the Arctic. And strange little touches, such as the monster leaving food to keep Frankenstein alive. I mean, it's, it's very creepy, and, and I think it's the best writing in the book. Victor has been stripped of everything, and, and um, is as barren and is as isolated as is the creature. Uh, so it's appropriate that the Arctic be the final place where this, uh, these two barren creatures, these two stripped creatures, uh, exist on a landscape that is absolutely devoid of any kind of human life, any kind of society, any kind of community. Just these two souls, which are in a sense two sides of the same person. The story has come full circle. Victor lies ailing in his sickbed on Walton's ship and soon dies. The monster, overwhelmed with guilt and despair at Victor's death, gives his final soliloquy. Farewell, Frankenstein. Soon I shall die, and what I now feel be no longer felt. Soon these burning miseries will be extinct. I shall ascend my funeral pile triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. And the tragedy of the novel is that all the human beings in the novel don't recognize the creature or monster as a full human being, and so they reject him. And that's really like rejecting hu humanity or humanness. I mean, it is a great disaster, and sort of, it's a very sad book. The final confrontation is, of course, the acknowledgment of each other, of Victor finally acknowledging and accepting the dark side of himself, accepting the creature, accepting this thing that he created and abandoned who has been seeking revenge on him all, all the way. And once that's done, of course, once that happens, uh, Victor can die of exhaustion, basically. The creature doesn't kill him, he dies of exhaustion, and the creature knows that he has no, no future, nothing left, and he, of course, drifts off into the mists as the novel ends. Almost as soon as Frankenstein was published, the acting community pounced on the story. A delighted Mary Shelley attended a performance of the first play in 1823. It was a time that demanded theatrical excess. Actors were melodramatic, full of grand gestures and exaggerated staging. In the 19th century, was, there was a tremendous emphasis on special effects. Uh, I mean, Spielberg and Lucas would have, would have thrived in that environment. They loved avalanches, hurricanes, battles, sea battles on the stage. So you can see that Frankenstein was a natural for the 19th century theater. Enjoy a triumph never yet attained by mortal man! The Man and the Monster was one of the early theatrical versions, making its debut in 1826. The breath of life now swells in his bosom, and as the cool night breeze plays upon its brow, it will awake to sense and motion! <gasps> Merciful heaven! The modern conception of the monster 
was not the conception of the monster in the uh, early part of the 1800s. Would have been a lot different, probably more like a gargoyle or a, uh, some kind of a, um, a half, you know, half human creature of some sort. And of course, their technology is very limited in terms of special effects, uh, and there was only so much they could do. Instead of the fresh color of humanity. It wears the livid hue of the damp grave. <gasps> horror! 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 The press hated the play. Tabloids warned of the drama's ungodly overtones, proclaiming it to be a bad influence on the audience. But the public swarmed to the theater. <laughs> Oh, oh, let me fly this dreadful monster of my own creation. Oh. In this play, Victor leaves behind a wife and child when he sets off to create his monster. Here we meet Emmeline and her father in the woods, searching for Victor. We shall find him soon. I'm sure we shall. And when he sees thy ruddy, smiling cheek and marks his Emmeline's wan and haggard features, his heart will turn to us and he will again be all our own. I don't believe a word of it. Talk of his heart indeed. He has no heart. If ever he had any, it is evaporated in the fumes of his diabolical preparations. He love and protect you. All his affections are in the bottom of a crucible. And in the wild chimeras of his signs and the dreams of his mad ambitions. The acting style was really dictated in large part by the audience. Because the audience was there to have a good time, the actors had to draw attention to themselves to be heard. So they would have to have very large gestures so people in the back who wanted to hear would know who was talking. Because often there was so much noise and smoke as well in the theaters and that sort of thing that they couldn't tell. So the actors had to be physically uh, as well as vocally almost gymnastic sometimes to simply be heard, to simply get their, uh, their lines out. Nature gave me powers, and I could not sink beneath the grateful burthen. Ah! What appeal was there? Heaven itself joins in the persecution of the hapless Emmeline. Oh, Father! Father, come to me! I sink. I die. Oh, Frankenstein! Frankenstein! Nearly two dozen versions of Frankenstein made it to the stage before the turn of the century. And with the arrival of motion pictures, Mary Shelley's story was an obvious choice. It seems appropriate that the inventor of the motion picture camera was the first to capture the monster on film. In 1910, Thomas Alva Edison produced a 16-minute movie called Frankenstein. Edison's monster was born of chemicals, not electricity. The monster's creation is an example of early special effects, which weren't much more than smoke and mirrors. In this sequence, Edison reversed the film, making the blazing monster appear to emerge from the ashes. The audience was captivated and Edison had set a precedent. Creation scenes for all future Frankensteins became more and more dramatic. Here the 
a few of the girls of the 1931 Follies. The Empire State Building was completed in 1931, stretching 132 stories. Nineteen thirty one was also the year the monster made headlines. James Whale's production with Colin Clive as the doctor and Boris Karloff as the monster defined the face of Frankenstein forever. Why, what's the matter? Look. There's nothing to fear. Look. No blood, no decay. Just a few stitches. And look, here's the final touch. The brain you stole, Fritz. Yes. Think of it, the brain of a dead man, waiting to live again in a body I made with my own hands. With my own hands. Forrest Ackerman, science fiction collector and Frankenstein fan, went to the movie's premiere. Well, I got down to the theater and they were all out on their horror hype. They had an ambulance in front of the theater and uh, as you walked in, there were nurses in attendance. And during the, uh, the film, there was one particular highlight and a lady in the audience screamed, jumped up, ran up the aisle. Well, uh, at the age of 15, I wasn't acquainted with uh, Hollywood hype, and uh, I took that to be absolutely uh, a serious reaction. But uh, I was so fascinated by the film, I stayed to see it two or three more times, and I noticed each time the same sequence, the same lady in the same seat <laughs> jumped up, went running up the aisle. You have created a monster, and it will destroy you. I've got to experiment further. He's only a few days old, remember? So far, he's been kept in complete darkness. Wait till I bring him into the light. Here he comes. Let's turn out the light. Universal's very first version of Dr. Frankenstein's reaction to his monster coming to life was apparently too scandalous for the times. But as for the famous line of, of Colin Clive in a paroxysm of, of creation, he, he, he just can't contain himself. He says, it's moving, it's alive, it's moving, it's alive, it's alive in the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God. I imagine that there was some uh, religious objection to a uh, man saying that uh, he felt like God. And so uh, after the first week, that was, was excised. It was a, a time in motion pictures when um, whenever you had a mad scientist, they would always wind up by saying, he tampered in God's domain. He meddled with things man was meant to leave alone. Frankenstein was a sensation. Variety saluted the film as the biggest money picture in the country and Boris Karloff was typecast for life. Boris Karloff, when you took off the mask of the monster, there was Santa Claus. I was the misshapen creature in those depression days of 1931 that had to compete with Father Christmas to bring pleasure to people during Yuletide. But somehow it worked. People queued up at box offices all over the country, breaking records. And afterwards, it was evident that millions all over the world felt sympathy for the monster. It was clear from the letters they sent that, while they were terrified by my characterization, at the same time they pitied the monster that I portrayed. And that pleased me because it was exactly what I had hoped. So he always spoke of the, 
the monster in, in very friendly terms that it was the best thing that ever happened to him. He didn't mind being typecast as a monster. In 1935, The Bride of Frankenstein premiered. It has been hailed by many as the finest horror film ever made, closer to the novel than the original film. It created even more sympathy for the unfortunate monster. Well, Bride of Frankenstein is my favorite of all the movies, my favorite horror movie of all time, forever. And my favorite part is the part where Frankenstein's monster goes to visit the blind man in the forest. The blind man is playing his violin, and the monster, wounded, upset, disoriented, rejected, <laughs> stumbles into the blind man's cottage, and they become friends. Before you came, I was all alone. It is bad to be alone. Alone. Bad. Friend. Good. Friend. I think all the great monster stories, in a way, have made the monster sympathetic. It's amazing how we've forgotten that in the late 20th century. Um, a lot of our latest horror movies rely on pyrotechnics and special effects, and they really have forgotten that very early on, uh, Dracula was a charmer in the movies. Frankenstein reached for the light, wept, you know, when the old man befriended him and bride of Frankenstein. Um, and the wolfman was always begging for compassion and understanding. <laughs> there is good, and there is bad. Good, bad. Good. <laughs> Music. <laughs> 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 I think that image of Karloff conveys the pathos, the pain, the alienation, the confusion, uh, the rage, uh, a great deal of what the, uh, what the book does. And, and, and film being what it is, it, 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 you need to have to have a visual creature, uh, uh, an articulate, a talking creature. Uh, the book is about words and the film is about, is about images. <laughs> After the success of the first two films, the industry literally exploded with Frankensteins. I do know that vampires, werewolves, angels, Satan, the devil, these are figures that our imagination longs for. We want to see them and we want to, we want to see dramas or read dramas in which they talk about life. We tire of just talking about the manners and morals of the middle class in America. We wear out on that. On the heels of the first movies came the radio serials. It has life. My experiment has succeeded. I have created life, Victor. This is too horrible. Destroy it now! To destroy it now would be murder. Although this creature is terrible to look upon, it is a man. It has life. It has feelings just as you and I. When Frankenstein made the transition to television, his character was more bumbling and benevolent than frightening. The monster's movie career continued. In the 1970s, Mel Brooks directed a loving homage to the original. We can see why the book can lend itself to melodrama, and we can see why it can lend itself to comedy. After all, comedy very often deals with the most serious topics in life. And uh, I think that's sort of amusing in a way because so often people who have done versions of Frankenstein have missed the point of its seriousness Whereas, in a sort of backhanded way, the comedies recognize it. <laughs> this is a nice boy. This is a good boy. This is a mother's angel. And I want the world to know, once and for all, and without any shame, that we love him. <laughs> Oh. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you how to walk, how to speak, how to move, how to think. Together, 
you and I are going to make the greatest single contribution to science since the creation of fire. Dr. Frankenstein, are you all right? My name is Frankenstein. Frankenstein comedies also found a welcome home in comic books. But pop culture was not the only vehicle for the monster. His symbolic warning of man-made demagoguery began to appear in political cartoons. It originated a myth that has become one of the guiding tropes of our popular culture. I mean, every schoolboy knows, you know, if you say, watch out or you'll create a Frankenstein, everybody knows what that means, that you'll create a monster that can destroy you. It's the kind of metaphor that, that, that assumes the needs, the tastes, the desires, the nightmares as well, of other cultures, of subsequent cultures, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why it can be retranslated into, into so many different forms. She just told a story that turned out to be of mythic power, and it's no surprise to me that there are hundreds and hundreds of Frankenstein films. I mean, other than Universal Studios, I mean, there are many, many, many twists and variations on Frankenstein, and there always will be. The mournful eyes of Frankenstein's monster have touched the hearts of generations. He is a reminder of how cruel humanity can be when its conscience is abandoned. Mary Shelley's message reaches beyond private morality, making us aware of our accountability when we tamper with nature. The monster's very existence is a condemnation of science without soul. Frankenstein is even more compelling today than when it was first written uh, because we are, we are not only dealing with some of the issues that Mary Shelley society was dealing with, uh, we have intensified the problems, uh, such problems as uh, DNA uh, on the science front, such problems as uh, the forms of government uh, on the political side. Uh, make the book so important because it raises the important questions, not only of the problem, but how are we going to resolve it and who is going to take responsibility for those resolutions. I don't think we'll ever stop telling the story in one form or another. In fact, the story is told over and over again without using the name Frankenstein. The person that tries to create artificial life, that tries to cheat death, that tries to reanimate, or tries to make the perfect um, soulless replica of a human being. I mean, it's, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating thing. Maybe because, maybe because in part, we feel like monsters. <laughs> 